Hi, I'm Yolanda Condonassis, and this is Living the Classical Life. Yolanda, thank you so much for being on the show. It's a delight to welcome you here, and I have wanted to have you on for a very long time. Oh, well, I'm so thrilled, and I'm so happy to be here. Well, I was just amused to realize today, in fact, that this would be our first in-person meeting ever, and we've both been in Cleveland forever and ever. Many moons. So here we are in, <laughs> in New York City, and I'm just thinking about the fact that you were born in Norman, Oklahoma, and I wonder how growing up there how would you even realize what a harp is and that a person could play harp and make a life <laughs> out of that? My mother uh, was a pianist and a musician, piano teacher to the masses in Norman, Oklahoma. And uh, my dad is a retired economics professor there. Uh, he taught for 50 years at the University of Oklahoma. So that's why we were there. Uh, we were not native Oklahomans. Um, and uh, I studied the piano from just earliest memory, the three probably. I don't ever remember not reading music and playing the piano. Probably I read music before I read words. And, um, uh, you know, but growing up where I did, I was uh, a pretty good tomboy. Uh, got dirty a lot, uh, played with worms and you know, shot hoops and that kind of thing. And I think my mom, when I was about nine or 10, you know, moms being moms, I think she wanted to refine me a bit. And if I was going to play a second instrument, she wanted me to play one that perhaps would have that slightly refining touch. And she also knew I'd be the only harpist in Norman, Oklahoma. So <laughs> I'll play that. Well, that's an advantage. Um, so it was a very small harp without pedals. And because I'd played the piano for so long, it came really quickly. And, um, uh, you know, I think even now I'm a, I'm a pianist at heart. Hmm. That's the way I approach the harp. Um, and possibly, I'm sure there are other harpists who do this, but my sensibility, my uh, criteria, my sense of priorities uh, and, and, and musicianship, I think, comes from far more a pianist perspective than, than someone who might have begun their musical studies on the harp. And I think probably if you really look at it, I've spent my whole life trying to make the harp sound like a piano with the same clarity and the same um, control and dexterity and, and crystalline precision of nuance. Uh, controlling the resonance is a huge thing because on the piano, you know, there, you have a lot more help with that. Uh, you let go of a key and it goes away, pretty much. If you want it to ring, of course, you press a pedal. On the harp, it's the opposite. If you, if you just let it go, it rings. And depending on the string, it rings forever. But if you want it to stop, you have to do all that manually. So my life as a harpist, I think, has been an exploration of trying to 
perhaps combine the best of both of those worlds, the resonance, the color, the timbre of this instrument, which is quite different in many ways than the piano, but to get all of what I consider the best of, of the piano. And um, I think it's just, I'd say in the last few years, I have realized how much that informs my approach to the harp. Well, that's absolutely fascinating because I was just watching, <clears throat> listening to a YouTube performance of yours. I believe you were playing a sonata by Scarlatti, and I'm, and I'm listening to the performance and, and seeing, of course, the harp being a plucked mechanism. How a harpist can sustain this horizontal tension of the music when it's really just a, mm -hmm. a momentary uh, contact point, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how we develop this instinct of musical inner tension. If that's just something we feel or we practice, I don't know. I was fascinated to hear that this could take place on a harp. Yeah, I think, you know, it's an odd double-edged sword because uh, the, the harp is basically a percussion instrument. You, you strike, you, you pluck the string. Everything on the harp is manual. There's nothing automatic. On, on the, the modern double action uh, pedal harp that we use today. And, you know, every kind of articulation is manual. Um, of course, all the chromaticism is mechanical, manual. So um, I think it's not only do we have the challenge of trying to sustain a phrase, a sound, a line, like a single line instrument, not so much kind of deviating from the idea of piano sound, but you know, as if we had a bow. How do we, how do we make a sound that, that where we can create nuance within a single pitch? Um, and yet at the same time, how do we manage all that resonance to, to have the kind of clarity that I think we need for a lot of, of of what we do and what I think is necessary to have a really satisfying musical product. I think probably a large reason I picked the harp uh, was because I felt that um, there was more room for me to make a difference with that instrument. Um, had I not come to that conclusion, I might have still been a pianist. I was going to do one or the other for sure. But I played the piano all through high school at Interlochen Arts Academy, and that was very, very important to me. I love the repertoire, and and you know when you've done something for so long, it's it's like a part of you. So I think I decided, you know, there's a lot I loved about the harp, uh, just the tactile sense of it. It's like a really um, addictive toy in a way, physically, because it's difficult. It's awkward. It's, but then you, you figure it out, and it's, it's like, wow, you, you, know, you got one side of the Rubik's Cube, all one color, you know? At, at what point did you realize, okay, so you were deciding between piano and harp. At what point did you start to become aware that there was some musical life within yourself, some impulse that was growing on its own? Or, or did that really consciously enter the picture? I think it did. I think that, you know, for all slightly precocious young musicians, um, there is a point, it, it, it's, like a, it's like a boundary that you cross over. When, when you stop being just thrilled with yourself because you can play so many notes so fast <laughs> and, and, you know, all the adults are just thinking, oh my gosh, she's a prodigy. When you get over yourself and you get over <laughs> that and start realizing that, um, wow, there's, you know, it's, it's that moment when you realize how much you don't even know you don't know. And that's, um, uh, you know, luckily, because I started early, I, I began that process in high school. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes folks a little bit longer to kind of, you know, cross that, cross that line. But I do feel like I remember hearing a tape of my, and back in the days when we called them tapes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I remember hearing a tape of myself that I made for something or other in high school. And um, it, was, it was, I've had a lot of turning points in terms of you know, self-examination as a, as a musician. But 
many of them have come from being able to stand back and listen to myself. Um, and I remember hearing this tape, I believe I was probably a freshman, sophomore in high school, and I was just appalled. It was fast, it was clean, it was even, but it was nothing. There was, I felt like there was very little style, there was very little um, uh, emotion attached to it. There, it, it felt like I had blown through something very impressively and, you know, wow, she's got chops, but nothing else. And I remember looking at that, and that was the beginning of sort of <laughs> the education of myself, where I started thinking, you know, and, and sometimes it gets reinforced when you're young. I'm sure you experience this too, where you get all these people saying, oh, you're so good, you're so good. You know, nobody can do that. But yeah, who cares? Who, right. who cares at all until you figure out what your voice is, what you want to say, how you, how you can really move people with all those notes. You're nothing more than a MIDI, um, you know, uh, device. Have there been any moments in your life where you felt your biggest jump in musical growth was uh, caused by something unrelated to practicing? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I'll give the example for myself that I have sometimes had a life experience or seen a new place or even just been on a walk. Mm -hmm and thought about a musical phrase, and then something clicked into place as to what's the reason for that phrase to be? What is it saying? How do I feel that? What is the whole context? I haven't practiced that phrase, but mm -hmm. I go back to the piano, not even the same day, but find mm -hmm. that I have perhaps become a better musician. Oh, yeah. I see what you're, you're talking about, and I think uh, I think I definitely experienced that a lot. I would say some of my most creative times um, have been just in the first hour of the day, and I'm a coffee addict. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I think that it, it's something that I hope this very current generation can still find for themselves, which is just quiet. Quiet time, nothing on, not, no screens, no, no nothing. Um, and, and I generally, whenever I can, I get up in time to uh, make myself a cup of coffee, really strong coffee, and just sit down at the table and kind of wrap myself around it and stare into space. And I find that that, it, it, I suppose it's a kind of a, a form of meditation. You know, one thing I think about the most, and that's, that's continuously developing. I mean, when I look at my very first recording, first couple recordings with Telarc to some of the work I'm doing now, I feel like that quest for perfect timing is probably uh, my biggest obsession. And, uh, you know, like for instance, in, in the Jennifer Higdon concerto that, that has been a big project for me over the last couple of years, um, one of the movements ends with this just uh, amazing, perfect, major chord and and it's at the end of the conclusion of the last phrase but it's such an amazing chord however the placement of that chord has to be in in that inevitable tiny little window of time a min a, like a like a millisecond too late millisecond too early will ruin it and so i remember you know when we recorded it uh i wanted to do you know, two, three takes of that. And, um, you know, I think we got, we got them done. And, and I, at the very, the, the last one, after, we, you know, it was all covered, um, I said, uh, this was in, uh, we did a couple of very, very quiet things by myself that didn't involve the orchestra. And the producer said, well, I, th I think that sounded great. That, let me do one more <clears throat> because in 22 recordings, I do not think I have ever wished I played a note sooner. So could I try one more take where I wait just a little longer? You know, silence takes on massive proportion when you're in any kind of a big space or a performance setting. I thought, I just, 
I want to try one more split second on that chord. And so I waited just, I, I waited till I thought, okay, now, and then I waited another split second, and then I played it. And that's the one that turned out to be that inevitable little slice of time. Not too soon, not too late, but I think I am obsessed with timing. <laughs> if if uh, there were to be one thing that keeps me up at night, it's it's where how to put things and how to use the space between notes, because I think sometimes on an instrument like the harp, um, it's easy to get impatient between notes. I want to get a sense of what you advise to young performers or perhaps your own students. What the daily work of a musician looks like. Well, first of all, the harp is a really, really physical instrument. Uh, it depends on good technique, not just to prevent injury, but to, to make sure you can control the sound you're making, that, that um, your, your hands are obeying what your, your brain and your impulses are, are, are telling you to do. So for that reason, you know, I do try and observe at least somewhat of a regular regimen. I warm up every day. I'm not one of those people that just starts, you know, sits down and starts noodling around. I definitely go through my, I kind of call it my portal, mm -hmm. where, um, uh, you know, I have, um, I, I usually put a little arnica, arnica gel or Flexol on, yes. on the top of my knuckles, and mm -hmm. it, it's really more of a placebo ritual than anything else, um, but it just kind of makes me, it's almost like, you know, lube and oil. Well, it's a calming aromatherapy yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, and I put that and, and I, I start to, to do my warm up very slowly and, and you know, I wrote a, a, a method book um, and I have the entire third section of the whole book is on warm ups because I think that is, that is a ritual that I think as, as artists who also practice a very, very physical uh, activity we have to attend to our our tools which are our hands and arms and neck and shoulder and everything else I stretch I warm up I breathe a little bit and and it's sort of like getting into the zone it's it's like walking walking through the the portal and and for you know in that I, I am very regimented, but then every practice day looks a little bit different. I usually allow myself to mess around a little bit at mm -hmm. some point when you know a good bit of my my work is done. But I also I also don't practice kind of aimlessly. I, I I I'm constantly setting setting new goals. I think a lot of practice time can be wasted, and I think as we all get busier, and you know we do have jobs to do, we have pieces to learn premieres to prepare for, uh, stuff to do. So it can't just be sort of a ride on a magic carpet, you know, <laughs> waves of inspiration washing over us and, you know, that kind of thing. We just have to get to business. But I would say of everything I do in my life as a musician, probably practicing is what I enjoy the most. I'm, I'm kind of a solitary person, mm. actually. I don't mind that at all. In fact, I kind of love it. I think one of the biggest concerns that I see with my colleagues in conservatory is wondering how to get things started after mm -hmm. graduation. Well, you know, I feel like since I began, uh, the classical music, classical arts world in general has gone through quite a few uh, phases and stages and, and changes. Um, but when I began, there was kind of a formula still. You pound the pavement, you get some management, really good management, um, commission management. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you try to get a record contract, which I was thrilled uh, to, to be associated with Telarc uh, for so many years. They taught me an awful lot about recording, about just the business in general um, at a very critical time and, you know, got my, my voice out to, out to the world. But, you know, that was kind of a, a formula. I feel like now the sky's kind of the limit. There's, and, and in many ways, the increased opportunity, perhaps, through the internet, through all the ways that you can be heard and seen now, I think probably it's just as hard. 
because now you have to distinguish yourself among so much stuff. There's just a massive glut of talent out there and trying, it, it, you know, it's, it's no easier to distinguish yourself among that pile than it was, you know, back in the day when I began, when, you know, maybe the route and the access wasn't as clear and easy, but, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. But I would say that if I had one talent through those years that I would encourage everyone to try and develop, it's, it's opportunity recognition. I call, huh. I call that when I talk to my own students about it. Because you've got to be able to size up an opportunity, even if it doesn't seem like you know, it's a direct straight shot point A to B. You've got to have a little imagination and a little vision to see, you know, that could, that could be interesting. That could lead somewhere interesting. And, and so, you know, you've got to, like I said, it's, it's that imagination and looking at what you might have to offer, where that might place you, the, the collaborators you might meet and work with, what you might learn from them. It's not just all about connections. Sometimes it's just what you learn and what that does for, for you as an artist. Um, but I think if I, if I could say one thing that most of the time, not all, but most of the time I got pretty right, it mm -hmm. was in that opportunity recognition category. Did I didn't waste my time on stuff that, that wasn't right, and I, I pursued those things that did provide stepping stones. Is it the role of a teacher to advise the student initially? Did you have yes. someone advising yeah. you? Yeah. I, I had a wonderful mentor uh, and, and longtime teacher, Alice Shalafu, who um, you know invested a lot in, in me, and uh, you know I remember uh, some very heady conversations I had with her when I was 11, 12, where, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, sort of Star Wars style, <laughs> she, she told me, you know, kind of the speech to whom much is given, much is expected, and much is expected. <laughs> And, and so that, that was good. I, I happened to be the uh, kind of personality that, that was okay with that. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't crush me under the burden of, of expectation. Um, uh, but in terms of that, that idea of opportunity recognition, I, uh, I feel like that's where the, the reasoning side of my brain really helped me. I was really good at that cause and effect equation. I could project. I could, I could sit down with a yellow pad and I could say, well, yeah, this pays peanuts, but what, what, what are the pros? What are the cons? And I feel like sometimes um, young musicians particularly will practice false economy hmm. where, you know, when I moved to New York after my year in St. Louis, I had saved all I could, um, but I had very little, but I knew I needed a somewhat <laughs> decent place to stay. I knew I needed certain things I need, so that I was, I just signed on with ICM at the time, ICM, now it's Opus 3, but at, uh, I was with them for 12 years. And, and um, it, you know, I knew that I needed certain things so that I wasn't unduly struggling. So I used credit cards, I did whatever I needed to do to get myself situated. Because, hmm. you know, I, I tell my own students this, in fact, you know, if, if you give up prime practice time, prime lower paying opportunities so that you can make, you know, $600 at a wedding on a Sunday when you've got a competition the next week, You'll have your whole life to play weddings, if that's what you're, you, you know, not that there's anything wrong with weddings whatsoever, but, you know, you need to, you need to weigh out things, and, uh, you know, I was not rolling in cash in any way, shape, or form. In fact, one of my favorite stories is uh, my first year, 
with management here in New York, I think one of my very first gigs was a sub gig. Uh, because, you know, with managers, you know, it, it's, it's a booking year. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you sign on, then basically that first year is just booking or subbing. And I had some very interesting <laughs> subbing opportunities. You know, you get a call a couple days before somebody had a bike accident and off you go um, to, to fill in. And I was driving to Wheeling, West Virginia. And I had just moved to New York. And um, I, it took every bit of, of liquid available cash I had to get my car out of the garage. So much so that I had neglected to factor in the fact I needed quite a sum of money to get through the Pennsylvania turnpike. turnpike. And then there's the gas. And, well, gas was no problem. That, I had a shell card. But, but the, the turnpike was the problem because those were the days when they didn't take credit cards. You had to have, you had to have <laughs> liquid cash. So it took me, I think, like something like 11 hours to get from New York to Wheeling, West Virginia. Because, I because was, you had to bypass I, it. I was wending my way through rural Pennsylvania and you know, <laughs> buying food and gas at shell stations. But um, you know, those are the times that make you so appreciate when you, know, uh, you sort of stop to think a moment and, and say to yourself, well, you know what, that, that, was, that was good for me. I appreciate this moment right here a lot more because of times like that. Okay, but you also sort of glossed over a rather big detail there, which was you got the management at ICM. Mm -hmm. So at that time, at least, what was that like? Is that a form of competition? Is it a bit of competing and knowing the right people? What did that feel like for you before you had it, knowing you probably should get management, mm -hmm. and then knowing that you had it. What was that process like? Well, that's a, a, quite a process. I mean, and that's kind of referring back to that idea of the formula. There are lots of ways now to, to approach the idea of management, but I think that um, really good management with great connections, uh, you know, to the, um, ensembles and conductors and you know all that kind of stuff is was very critical for me and um, uh, it, you know it's a process and again I, I was just saying this to my own daughter the other day for whatever reason I have always been good at long processes I understand I have the patience to know that that's my goal but there are like 18 labor-intensive steps between here and there, but each one feels very productive for me as I'm working my way. First, you have to identify the steps, which is you know doing the kind of playing, being in the kind of visible position that you need to do, which sometimes does require taking low-paying gigs with high visibility, um, you know, getting to know people who can help you um, and, and having them get to know your playing. So they believe in you enough to speak on your behalf. Uh, you know, those are all, and sometimes you have to spend time creating those relationships. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a long process. Everything is a process. But I've, I've always been the kind of person that who's very energized by a process. I love a plan. I love a, a, an executable plan. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of, again, wraps back to the idea of um, creating a little series of stones that leads you to the island. You know, you have to um, be really smart about what you're doing. Time is at a premium, you can't do everything. But you have to be willing to throw some stuff on the credit card and say to yourself, well, if that works out, I can, I can pay that bill. You know, it, there's a little gambling involved. Do you feel like young people today, compared to where you were at that point as a student, do you, do you think that young people understand this need for patience and the long process? I mean, it doesn't seem like much in today's world is conditioning us for a long attention span to begin with. Well, you bring up a, a great point, because I think if there is something we are getting less good at, it is patience. And, uh, and that, that is ju not just in the present and the future, but I think sometimes it takes some patience to learn from the past 
as well. I think it's a long arc. I think the spectrum of, of not only having patience, but curiosity to, and that's why this thing you do is so amazing. It, it gives young folks um, a chance to look at a bunch of different pathways. How did, how did folks get there? I know I was endlessly curious about that when I was getting started. And I would talk to people and ask people, you know, very humbly, how, how on earth did, did you do it? And no two paths are the same. They never have been, they never will be. Um, but I think you have to kind of look at, at you need to do a lot of projecting forward and backwards at the same time, learning from history and then also imagining, you know, at the end of my career, what, what would I be most proud to leave behind, you know? And I think that's an, every artist should ask themselves that question, not just kind of go from gig to gig, you know, big audiences, small audiences, lots of recordings, you know, not so many, whatever. You have to have, um, a plan for your contribution, I think. And everything you do, especially after a certain point, and I'm in that, that time phase right now, where I am trying to do as many things as possible to, to address some of the things that I feel like my field may need or may benefit from or be better for. And, um, you know, that, that's a, a great way to feel purpose also as you move along those those stones on the way to every single little island you figure to yourself you know th this will leave things a little better it's worth doing it's mm -hmm. worth this endless proofing process it's worth this you know endless long arc of assembling a, a, a giant consortium of orchestras to fund a, a commission you know it's it's all those little steps Sometimes you need motivation, and I think that end of the line idea of what you can do to leave things better is a, a you know, a, a great motivator along with coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> um, motivation in a cup. In what capacity in your artistic creative life and you have many different outlets. You teach, you write books, you perform, you record. In what capacity or in what moment within those do you feel at your freest and most creative? Most recently, I've, I have begun to feel rather free on stage. It, I think it comes with an acceptance of yourself. You know, that perfectionism we were talking about before, uh, that, that self-critical nature. When you are in front of people, sometimes that is in high, high key gear. You're, you're the most self-critical when you're in those settings. But I think um, I have definitely had some performances in the last few years, two, three years, where I felt like I was at my freest, uh, most, uh, it was gratifying. It felt like I could make some, make some very unique things happen just in front of a giant hall full of people without having to so much consider making sure it never uh, dipped below a certain point. You get more comfortable taking risks. And I think the more comfortable you are taking risks, the better, better, they, the better they turn out. But um, yeah, I think I am feeling a lot of freedom on stage now, and just who I am. And you know, I think when when you're first starting out, I remember being very conscious of having to have a certain look, and you know, wear the right clothes. And and now I feel. Uh, a lot more free of that. I feel like we live in a time where authenticity is a lot more prized. Um, and I, I feel like I'm offering a pretty close version of myself to an audience now. It's not any kind of a, you know, I remember sometimes where I would show up at the airport and I would be, you know, in jeans with my hair up in a messy bun and, you know, 
windbreaker and nobody would know who I was. They would look around and you know, they'd be looking for Yolanda Condonassis and well, <laughs> she must not have made the plane, you know, and then it was like, hello. And they were like, what? <laughs> My glasses on. And then of course I'd have to go through this massive transformation and you know, d d you know for, the, for the stage. And now I feel, you know, I still, force myself to wear my contacts but um, other than that small concession I feel like I'm um, pretty close close to myself on stage what do you tell your students if they come to you saying that they don't feel that the world of stage is a comfortable natural free mm -hmm. place and they have a hard time with it well something I tell my students a lot is the stage will never be your living room. It will never be a, a kickback, chill out zone. That's, that's not the nature of the stage. So what I usually suggest is trying to make their practice room a little less comfortable. And I do this for myself a lot. Even though you know practice is my sanctuary, it's, it's a sanctuary in the sense that I can manipulate my, my state of mind very easily in that space. So I have all sorts of paces I put myself through it's like imaging, it's like sports psychology where you know you imagine yourself in the situation, you, you set up gauntlets for yourself where, um, like for instance, if there's something very tricky, uh, instead of you know, the performance requirement of doing it perfectly once, I set the gauntlet of doing it perfectly eight times. And if I'm on the seventh time and I screw up, I'm back at one. So that, that sort of simulates a, a stake in, in the result by the sixth, seventh, eighth time where it's sort of like that one shot feeling where I, you know, I'm sitting here for another 45 minutes if I don't, <laughs> if I don't nail it on this eighth time. And if you keep yourself honest with that, it's a way of kind of raising the stakes of creating a heightened alertness. And you know, there are a lot of ways of, of doing that. I think imaging is really important. I imagine that would have vastly increased your consistency as a performer, oh, such yeah. an exercise. Oh, yeah. And you know the little mantra you need to say before, you know, it's sort of like a, I tell my students it's a little bit like, um, you know, I grew up with cats, and before a cat uh, pounces, you know, they kind of do this this little, little wiggle thing. And I feel like I know exactly what little thing I got to do, what I need to tell myself, what, you know, it's like a ramp up to things. It, you be, begin to have, on a purely technical level, you begin to have a formula for execution under, under stress. And that, you know, and again, it's that reasoning side. It's like, I, I, I don't operate entirely in the formula zone, but I find it very helpful when I need one. How have you navigated the periods in your life with the inevitable setbacks, disappointments, discouragements, slumps, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm very hard on myself. And um, for the most part, I hope this is true, but for the most part I have tried not to subject others to my slumps as much as humanly possible. I think we all have them, and so um, I think it's just, it, it, I think for any artist it's important to be really self-reflective and, and, and acknowledge what you're feeling. Acknowledge um, one's self-critical nature, but then try if you can, which is always what I've tried to do, I allow myself to, to feel it. But then uh, it's time for a plan. It's time to, you know, basically, the, the strategy for moving on is the antidote to the slump. So, uh, you know, however, if you just move on without feeling, feeling the moment, uh, it, will, it will catch up with you. So I think it's kind of a, a two-pronged phase where you need to, you know, I've had, I've had some low moments in my life. Um, uh, you know, I think most artists do whether those are, are personal moments, whether they are uh, you know, health moments, whether they are uh, family moments. You know, we're not just artists or people. 
we're, we're humans. And sometimes I have to remind myself, my students, my daughter, you know, we're not robots. We're not, we're not uh, you know, highly functioning, breathing, uh, programmed creatures. We, we have to kind of allow a little space to feel what we're feeling. And I think sometimes, at least in my case, the more I, the more life I give it, and I guess that goes back to my slightly solitary nature, but the more life I give it by recounting it and, and, and you know, regurgitating it a million times and seeking support in 20 places, the, the more life, it's almost like I'm giving it oxygen. So I feel it, I let myself be as low as I need to be, and then it's like, all right, let's grab the yellow pad, let's figure out what's next, you know? What's inspiring you these days, musically or otherwise? Mm, I've got some projects that I'm really, really excited about, and I feel like, you know, with some of that freedom I was talking to you about, it almost feels like, you know, I've been at this a while. So, you know, it's almost like a little bit of a renaissance, an artistic renaissance, I feel right now, because, you know, perhaps I've earned a little bit of uh, you know, a little bit of capital to make some projects happen that, that just just because I want to, you know, just because it inspires me, just because it's stuff that I would listen to, I would want to do. And I'm really excited about merging some of my earth um, uh, conservation work with music a little bit more closely and got some stuff in the pipeline on that. And, and um, uh, you know, I just, I feel like I'm at a really wonderful point where I can choose things almost entirely just because I want to do them. And that is, I think, the biggest, you know, reward. You know, I don't have five Bentleys, but, you know, uh, that, is, that is the reward, to feel like um, I'm in a position where my projects are driven by interest and inspiration. That's, I think that's the only place any of us can hope to be. Yolanda, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been such a delight speaking about life and music, and I'm so grateful to you. Thank you. Thank it's you. been a great pleasure. Ooh. Ha, ha, ha.